So, welcome to our session tonight, guys. So, this is uh, our monthly Profit Max and Tropolis Network Bridging Night. And tonight we have a guest with us who's going to help us to unpack uh, digital PR, digital public relations. So in today's complex, complex and complicated world where things are moving faster and faster and more and more online, more and more digital, it's good for us to understand a bit more about this. And what we're going to do is learn how to leverage on digital PR for our business, whatever business we may be in. And all of us come from different, different businesses. Some of us are in manufacturing, some of us in construction, some of us in professional services and what have you. Uh, some of us are in fintech, some of us are in online businesses, tech, tech businesses and so on and so forth. So what is the role of digital PR? And I, I think it couldn't be more timely, you know. So we, we selected this session weeks ago before the current crisis, the, all the hoo-ha you're hearing these few days about hapsing biscuits and cream crackers and how they cause cancer and all that. So big hoo-ha there. Definitely a PR issue, definitely for a call for crisis communications and issues management. But we're not going to go into that yet. So I want to first of all bring on and welcome Aldrich, our guest speaker for tonight. Aldrich Tinker Toyat has uh, something like 15 years, more than 15 years experience in the realm of PR, public relations and so on. So I'm going to ask him to come on board and introduce himself. Aldrich, welcome. Tell us a bit about yourself. Give us a bit of your background. Hi, very good evening, everyone. So I'm Aldrich Tinkatoyat. Um, my journey started as a copywriter, by the way. I was a copywriter, a blogger back in 2006. Um, I, was, I enjoyed writing. And uh, from writing blogs, I, it landed, it led from one thing to another, including writing speeches for and questions for a member of the Dewan Negara when I was still in uni uh, until I dropped out and uh, wrote broad advertising uh, advertisement for broadcasting, both radio and TVs. Uh, my foray into PR was not as far back. In fact, it started the earliest is 2016 when uh, I was hired by a social analytics and digital media consultancy. So what do I do? I sit down with two monitors, just two, unlike John, who may have eight, <laughs> and look at social media, look at digital media every day, every well, almost every night, depending on context, um, identifying what matters to the client, alerting the clients, preparing management report. Sometimes it goes all the way to the minister level. Sometimes we are summoned by the minister to you know, to answer, you know, what's happening, are these people real, policy makers, uh, heads of corporate communication, especially. Now that, uh, <clears throat> from there, you know, I'm, I was wondering, what's the next step? Because at the point of time, it's just data, comms, data, quantify. But what next? That's when one encounter with a client's other agency, a PR agency, added that bridge. And uh, that started in 2019. Uh, from there, the world of PR expanded for me and it is huge. Um, I pride my, I would like to call myself as someone who sees communication as an integrated business function. But again, within this uh, communication, like I said, PR is massive. Marketing comm is massive and every other related uh, business, uh, marketing, sorry, communications, uh, business function. Yeah, that's a bit of a background. Okay. Yeah, that's a good place to start off, uh, um, Aldrich. I was going to ask you, you know, can you break down for us the different, because PR is actually very, very broad. Some people misuse it and say, my boss got very good PR, you no? Know? And, and that's really not the right, not the right connotation of what PR covers. So PR is a very broad subject. Maybe you can tell us what are, the, what are the things that come under PR, public relations, and then after that, we'll go into you know, the digital part of it. Okay, so I'm gonna backtrack a bit. So PR and marketing is often seen as you know, two competing business function, but in terms of discipline, they're not competing because marketing, you're trying to create a demand for a product, service, or you know, uh, for your product, service, or solution. You know, from no one being interested to 
scores of buyers, scores of customers. You have various activities under marketing. You have your research, you have your um, focus groups, you have your advertising, your marketing comms. PR, on the other hand, is what I'd like to take what, uh, the word which Sanji, Sanji used, uh, Sanji, sorry, Sanji mentioned earlier on, the stakeholders management, the public, you know, uh, who are not your buyers. Uh, so organizations have to manage external parties, your community surrounding your plant, your NGO, your focus groups. Earlier on, Peter mentioned, you know, the palm oil industry. There are focus groups, advocates in there, which can either support or hamper your overall industry or support your industry, right? And then you also have uh, policymakers, policymakers as well as lawmakers, two completely different um, groups we have different motivations. So policymakers are your civil servants. Lawmakers are your politicians. How do you handle them? So that's where PR comes in. One subset, one popular subset is media relations, getting interviews, getting engagement, re, uh, distributing press releases. That is a small part of PR. And uh, Ultimately, yeah, you want to manage that reputation through these channels because what we don't want is when, you know, when things hit the fan, we want to make sure that we're prepared. And often because PR is not as uh, numbers driven like marketing, it is, they are left in the back seat. And this is very prevalent in different organizations, whether big or small. Usually when there's a crisis, then PR comes into the room. If there's no crisis, it's just marketing and sales. Now, every time there's management meeting, marketing, sales, what's the numbers? PR, okay, like if you have time, you have five minutes, too much time, give them two minutes. <laughs> but that's not it. You know, PR is there to nurture the different stakeholders as the business progress. So that is what PR is. Okay. That's a good point, good distinction, uh, Andre. Because you know, in big organizations like Sim W or MAS, they got corporate communications, they got they got marketing communications, and and you know, marketing communications most marketers are very familiar with, but corporate com, people are wondering why do we need a whole department for that? No, why do we need a corporate com director or corporate com uh, manager? You know, because it's significant, it's very complex, not as easy as it sounds, huh, as it looks. Okay. Correct. And so, some so tell us, com, sorry. Uh, yeah, and some corporate com, some organizations make the mistake that corporate comms takes care of the CEO. Yeah, the objective is to get interviews for the CEO, and that's it, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, all right. Okay, tell us the difference, Aldrich, between uh, what you call traditional or conventional PR and what we are now seeing digital PR. What, what, are the, what are the differences and similarities? Okay, I would say now there are more similarities because as you pointed earlier on, everyone is migrating from conventional, from print into digital space. Uh, Oriental Daily, for example, uh, they don't have any more print edition. Uh, you still need people to talk about you, you your, your company, your brand, your service, uh, whether to anticipate crisis, to promote a launch, to prevent or mitigate crisis, you need these conversations. So digital PR is having it enabled on digital platforms, whether it's your forums like Lawyer, Chari Gold, um, you engage in digital um, mainstream media like FMT, Free Malaysia Today, or uh, Malaysia Kini, as well as blogs. That's where it's a bit different from uh, what they call this, uh, conventional PR. But as people realize uh, it overlaps, as things become, as the border starts to, you know, be, uh, start to disappear, it is an integrated thing. It's very hard to ignore because, for example, influencers, when you're having an event, you don't want them just to, you know, publicize the, the event before of, of, or after without being at the event. These influencers have fans. You want them to be present at that time. You want, to be, you want them to be there live streaming or capturing the, mo the moment. 
for their fans, especially if it's a multi-day event. And this is done a lot by consumer, consumer uh, for consumer brands. Uh, they get you know they build the hype. You want that ongoing. Uh, you want that ongoing uh, publicity, you know, coverage, awareness. Yeah, mm. because once doesn't stick. Right, it's it's very natural for us. I mean, we introduce ourselves just once. We often forget each other's names, but if there's a, re a repeated uh, in uh, encounter, the name sticks. So that is essentially, you know, uh, that's the whole sim the fundamentals of it. And coming back, as I said, there's no real difference between there's no more any uh, difference between digital and conventional you still need both okay the principles are the same yeah all right so from what you describe outbreak is just a matter of choice of platforms and choice of media right now a lot of things are online i've got a supplementary question but before that just quickly I want to remind the audience and our, our guests um, if you've got questions please feel free to type it into the chat box and we'll come to the questions later on okay so supplementary question to this is, um, Audrey, what would be the overlap or the difference between digital marketing on one hand, which I think people are familiar with, and digital PR on the other hand? Money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's where the overlap happens, by the way. Um, some, new, uh, some influencers, some key opinion leaders, some media titles, they want investment before they publish news right um, digital marketing you need to pump in the money to get your uh, your brand across to get your posts across however right uh, usually when digital media is in uh, digital marketing is involved it is you promoting your own media meaning if you have a facebook page or an instagram profile you are boosting the post or the content on your page to who to whatever criterion whatever audience that you are aiming at whereas if you are engaging a third party influencer brand media title you're asked you're paying them to broadcast it sometimes to their own audience so that is why sometimes you'll notice on facebook on instagram on twitter sometimes twitter is not that um not that prevalent in Malaysia because the cost of advertising on Twitter is ridiculously expensive. But on Facebook, you see the star sponsored post, NST sponsored post, uh, Malaysia Kini sponsored post. That's because the whoever that was covered in that particular article paid an additional amount, not just for the coverage, but also for that promotion, that media buy promotion. So. If you were to go back to conventional, it's basically an advertorial with advertisement. Mm. Mm. You mentioned a couple of media brands there. You mentioned Star, FMT, Malaysia Kini, sponsored on Facebook. Yes. Are you saying these media brands are actually buying ads in Facebook? Yes, they do. It's part and parcel of their... Okay, so, some... so if you go up to their sales team, not through their editorial team, you can get some packages where they will feature you. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And it. they will boost it for you. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, so what, what you've just been describing sounds to me a lot like content creation. Correct. Okay. Tell, tell me a bit more about that. Tell me about content creation. Content creation. Okay, so it's a very, very wide scope, right? The moment we post something on Facebook, we are, by definition, a content creator. The moment we create videos, cut it into five seconds, we are content creators. The real difference is how well would these content resonate with the larger audience? That is where the question comes. And this is a good pivot to what we consider, you know, the, the micro influencers and micro key opinion leaders. Okay, just a quick uh, definition of the two. I know people like to overlap the two terms. So micro influencers are these celebrities that you find, you know, suddenly promoting. Today, they're promoting a t-shirt. Tomorrow, they're promoting shoes. Suddenly, a week later, they're promoting um, some herbal tea. 
you know, there's they're not exactly experts in their field, whereas key opinion leaders are experts. Some they're medically trained, for example, like Dr. Mala. She is a key, she is what we consider a key opinion leader, uh, especially among the Malay speaking grassroots. Her, she speaks on all these basic health issues on Facebook. Sorry, not face, not so much on Facebook, mostly on YouTube and TikTok. Right. And when people start to engage her and engage with her content, that's when uh, we really consider them as a worthwhile investment in terms of uh, creating the uh, hype. Mm. Mm. Okay. What about if you got a key opinion leader who is mm. not, not so famous in terms of they don't have their own big channels, but they could be well known. For example, I'm thinking of Dr. Amar Singh. I don't yeah. know where he is, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. he is he is still considered a key opinion leader or a, yeah. So what usually we do in the industry is we grade them. You have the super influencers or the super key opinion leaders. These are the people with you know millions of followers. The downfall of having huge followers is low engagement. Mm. Or they're following because of something else. Yeah, uh, the Kardashians yeah. or something. Correct, correct. <laughs> it's good if you have an FMCG product, right? You, yeah. you have, you're in FMCG, it's good. But if you have something that requires a lot more convincing, I mean, between Kim Kardashian and Dr. Amar Singh, uh, on to speak on COVID prevention, who would you listen to? Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, and that's the that's the difference between them. Yeah. Okay. And uh, also, sorry, I just remembered. Uh, when it comes to for me, niche is gold in this era. Many mm -hmm. people the budget to engage a large uh, of an influencer or a key opinion leader with a large following is often more expensive than all these micro influencers yeah. but the engagement between the micro influencers and their audience or the mm. micro micro kol and their audience will be higher compared to the ones with millions of followers but minimal engagement in mm. fact that's one of the ways that i try to that's one of the ways which i used to um, advise clients in the past because pumping money is one thing but are people engaged with what you're promoting or publicizing? Yeah. If they're not, I have to say you're really just wasting your money, irrespective of what beautiful numbers that are shown. Yes, yes. Yeah. To me, to me if, um, if you are in uh, e-commerce type product, you know, physical products, engaging in a micro influencer makes a lot of sense because they help you to promote to their following and if they have high engagement your brand gets a lot of connections there yeah so maybe you could give an i i, I don't know whether you can but maybe you can give us a ballpark figure of what it would cost to engage one of these people you no know, either micro influencer or micro kol okay, micro influencers they are not that expensive they're at most the lower thousands, not more than two thousand. Okay. For a campaign, so when I'm saying campaign, probably several posts. Uh, you have your um, okay, several posts about ten to to twenty, right? Mm -hmm. and they'll have they'll write things themselves. So micro influencers do take note are usually self employed, or they're yes. doing it as a side gig. Yes, yes. So they they're not really dependent on that. Yeah, I, I even have a client who is in uh, e-commerce, and she managed to find a micro influencer, who you know just by giving her some free products, you know, because she loves their product, she was going to do it for free, you know, and they didn't have to pay her. So she did, I think, six or seven posts and got a lot of following, and she really was was promoting from her heart rather than from being paid, you no. Know? So that was very Thank genuine. You. Yeah. That is the beauty of micro influencers. Yes. They, they, if they believe in what you're offering, they will go out to promote it. Yes. Whereas if you're showing money to the big brands, okay, as long as there's 200K for three posts, yeah. okay, I'll do it. Even though I don't believe in it, I'll just okay. chase it. I've got, I've got 200K. Do I hear 220? Do I hear 250? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I hope, I hope the big investors don't, don't kind of kill me for saying that. 
<laughs> okay, there's one influencer, and I was very angry with my then client. Uh, they engaged this particular influencer for a, a million ringgit for one year. Okay, to promote their brand, their technology, their um, services on her profile. Mm. When the influencer did that, the comments were high. Yes, but it was not about the client's product. It wasn't about the client's service. It, was, it wasn't about the client. It was happy birthday. Oh, mm. you look pretty today. My so goodness. It, it missed the mark. Yeah. <laughs> And to business owners, to advertisers, that's very frustrating because yes. I mean, one million is not cheap. I maybe maybe for them it's you know pocket change, but for most businesses, yeah. But even not, even it was pocket change is still wasted money, right? It's wasting exactly. your budget, not getting you the results. Yeah, exactly. I was like maybe you could share with us an example or case study of using digital PR to get mileage for a brand or a company. Okay, a general so example. So people can get it, can, can get the grasp the idea better. Definitely. I'll give you a general example so that we don't get into any uh, NDA issues. Gadgets. Gadgets, when there's a launch by, let's say, Samsung, Oppo, Vivo, uh, you see how many people are, fall, uh, how many people are suddenly promoting before the launch. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually they will not target the influencers first because you want to create, okay, the goal of PR is you want to get advocates. Mm. Advocates will then, you uh, that's where you leverage on the word of mouth. So you need the first batch of early adopters who knows their stuff, who knows technical specifications very well. Uh, not, not a casual user of, I'm going to take a photo here, you know, that sort of thing. They want people who, who and that's why uh, when Samsung launches or Oppo or Vivo, you notice the tech-oriented, gadget-oriented blogs, micro-influencers starting to roll out all these uh, content before the launch proper. They'll be invited for contests, you know, run contests on your, uh, run contests on your social media platforms. Mm. That way, get the hype for this so that when the news comes out, when people see the ad on Shopee, on Facebook, the general market will be excited. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Yeah, I think of a similar parallel in the car industry, right? So when a brand like Mercedes or any brand wants to launch a new car, they always talk to the car reviewers, right? The guys who write a column in the papers or in the media or whatever, portan.org or whatever, and get them to do a review, let them try out the car for one week or even two weeks if they want to, you know, uh, first hand so that they can they can publicize and create the create the what do you call the create the hype. The hype, yeah, the <laughs> hype, right? Before even the launch. And everyone's right. talking about it. Yeah. Because it's harder to harder to downplay the role of these influencers, mm. these uh, these content creators, these key opinion leaders, compared to let's say if Toyota or Mercedes engages Kim Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the market just misses the mark. Yeah. Okay. Question. When when you do things like that, do you pay? I mean, let's say the gadget situation, right? Are those tech guys who are doing the review or participating in the content, are they paid or they just uh, given a free phone or what? Sometimes uh -huh. they're given a free phone. Depending on the budget of a client, okay, I have I can't put it specific, but some clients actually give the phone to them, okay, because again they want, okay, so when it comes to gadgets, people want to see the out outcome, like the photos, the videos, the TikToks. So you want them to present this and quickly say, hey, this was shot on my, uh, shot on my this, shot on my that, right? Mm. Uh, so sometimes it is just a goodie bag, depending on the tier. So there is some cost. To it but it's very minimal right and and how would you how would you measure the roi you know if you put in a thousand or ten thousand bucks into a digital pr campaign how would you measure the return on that investment like you said right in marketing is all about numbers you put in a thousand on facebook or ten thousand on google ads you can see the returns because they will provide you a dashboard but in pr how do you how do you gauge how do you measure the response 
then that is a conventional one. The second method, which is my favorite, which I favor rather, does not have dollars and cents. You want to measure the number of conversations online. And this, you will need a tool. You will need, a, whether it's provided by an, a third party or whether you, the organization themselves subscribes to it. So some tools, these are social listening tools. You want to see how many people are talking about it. That is the first layer. Okay. The second layer is out of that conversation, how many are positive, how many are negative, how many are neutral. Then from there, we correlate with the other conversations down the road. That is for me more meaningful. The superficial manner is, oh, we have X amount of uh, engagement. I'll be honest, when I read, my, when I scroll, scroll through uh, Facebook, and I'm sure we all have this habit, when I scroll through Facebook, when I scroll through Instagram, when I like a post, it doesn't mean I read the post. It just means noted with thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless that post is by someone uh, that is close to us, or the topic is very meaningful to us. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's why I'd rather otherwise, measure it. Otherwise, it's what some people call vanity metrics, right? Correct. Is there are a lot of likes, but no engagement. No, what's the point, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. All and right. you want to see the soundbite being resonated further. Mm. Because again, like I said, you want that advocacy. How do you measure advocacy? People are repeating the sound bites that you want. Okay. All right. So um, I got one or two more questions before we open up for Q&A. So shifting to the SME sector, for example, no, who are probably not so used to using PR in the first place, what, what, what's your advice for, for SMEs to get used and get started with, with uh, digital PR? For example, in content creation, what are some do's and don'ts? What should they be looking at? Okay, I like to start, okay, for SMEs, uh, understanding that sometimes budget constraint, there is a budget constraint, right? Yeah. So number one, niche, nurture your niche. Mm. Nurture your niche. That is, don't scale first until that advocacy level is high. I'll give an early example, a good example, Clubhouse. Mm. No one knew what Clubhouse was until CNY this year. Why? Because all of a sudden, this bugger called Elon Musk was on it. <laughs> then everyone started downloading it. And then when Android users wanted to download it, oh, it's not available. It's only for iOS users. Yeah, yeah. And some more, there's that, oh, you know, detect, I want in, I want in. Now, no one is on Clubhouse. Yeah. <laughs> right? So you want that, uh, you start with a niche. The niche, the core, okay, the reason which I, uh, Clubhouse is also in a, a good example is because now after all the hype is done and dusted, it's back to the original users, the musicians, the people who just want to have conversations. Mm. Gone are these huge trend followers. Yes. Who will defend your brand in a crisis? Your advocates. Mm. And that is, with, uh, that is what uh, SMEs need to focus on. Uh, then after you cultivate your niche, identify your niche, make sure the marketing and the PR complements each other. Okay? Newspapers are reluctant to publish uh, promotional stories because News, we read the news for news, for updates. Yeah. We don't want to read about you know, something. We don't want to read about a sale or something. Okay, so when usually we see some FMCG brands having, uh, having news coverage on their launch, it's because they already paid. Yes. Uh, how you, call, you can correlate the number of ad ad advertisement taken with the amount of coverage. So mm. that coverage is considered added value. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, right. that's the second one I can share. So first was niche is better than scale. Second, okay. So uh, 
the focus on advocacy. The second consideration is strengthen internal buy-ins. Strengthen internal buy-ins. And this is one aspect of PR that we often neglect. Uh, what do I mean by internal buy-ins? Never mind your customers, your staff. If you have staff, how often do you see them sharing genuinely about your product or service? If it's not your staff, you know someone working in a large organization that has a B2C offering. How often do you see them genuinely sharing news or content about their organization, about their brand. It doesn't have to be promotional, yeah? It doesn't have to be promotional. It can be positive news. It can be CSR in, uh, on their social media. I had one client once upon a time. Uh, they did a competition, an internal PR competition, internal uh, to encourage staff. They had about 50 headcount. You know, let's create a buzz. We have 50 people. The CEO was excited. The marketing manager was reluctant. Uh, the, re the marketing manager told us, the only reason I agreed to this campaign and decide to run the campaign is to prove to my boss it will not work. <laughs> That's very encouraging. <laughs> okay. So... Advocates. Okay, so you see different uh, over the years. We've seen different employees who genuinely advocate their brands. You criticize a bit; they'll be the first people to defend their brand. And this is something we ignore. So the quest, the next question, which everyone has to answer individually. Uh, there's no, there's no, you know, there's no one size one size fits all. How do I make my own internal team members my advocates? Mm. Mm. Yep. And, and if you're talking about that, I guess the best medium I can think of is actually LinkedIn. LinkedIn. So if an organization you know, puts up something about the company getting an award or something, everybody jumps on it, no? Right. Uh, okay. And Applying principle of BNI, right? We know that behind every person that's in the room, there's hundreds and thousands of other connections. These people have the same thing when it comes to their social media. A loner in the office could have 2,000 followers on Instagram. Okay. Can you imagine what the stories at, hey, I'm at, the, I'm at a company event, what that does in terms of mm. the buzz? Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any final tips for SMEs in terms of uh, how they can exploit digital PR for their business? Uh, digital, okay, so the, yeah, complement PR with marketing. Uh, make sure that whatever, keep it human uh, is one thing that I like to say. You know, keep it human because we're trying to get people to speak about us in a humanly way, not humane, uh, as opposed to humanely way. So, uh, just be ready to engage, especially when things don't go our way. One of the things which uh, turn many businesses off in, in, in exploring PR is because you lost control of the narrative. Mm. You depend on the grace, mercy, and favor of whoever that's going to carry the message. And God forbid, that person hates your brand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay all right <laughs> unless that's your strategy okay that, unless that's your strategy you know like how some organizations let's throw a let's throw a controversy so that people start talking yeah yeah <laughs> yeah like like tima whiskey exactly <laughs> tima okay. whiskey is a good one all right so thanks thanks a lot for your sharing uh Audrey, appreciate it i think we got some good insights on digital pr and uh, hopefully, you know, we get more usage by SME sector encouragement to use more digital PR, to curate their content, to strategize with their content, to get the necessary engagement with the audience that they, they, they want to. Okay, thanks.